Good morning. What a stunningly beautiful day. Two in a row. I don't know if it's the end of the world or what exactly is going on. But if this is the end of the world, I'm all for it. That's a, it's working for me. Glad you're really, really glad that you're here today. And uh, this morning we're continuing on in our series in Hebrews. Hebrews is very much a, a book that was written to insiders, people who've been raised in Jewish culture all their lives. And so it's hard to read and hard to understand. But the basic question that the author of Hebrews is trying to address is that if I'm heading in the right direction, why is life so hard? And I think that question crosses every culture and every generation. And so this morning we're continuing on in our series and we're in Hebrews chapter 13. And we are beginning in verse 11. And once again, there's a reference to an insider understanding here, but we'll unpack it a little bit as we go. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp bearing the disgrace he bore. For here, we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased." I don't know whether your preference is to live in the city or the country, but scripture reveals that the human story begins in a garden and it ends in a city. Adam and Eve, the first humans, lived in Eden, which was considered paradise. There was lots of nature, and Adam and Eve just had each other. They were only two people. But as people populated our world, it required some different living arrangements. And so cities began to be developed and systems began to be created to defend themselves against enemies, to make sure that there was sustainable food transportation so that their population would not perish, and, and to have opportunity for commerce so that, that people could do well in a society. If you live in a city, it just requires people to move more closely together, and there's some rules that kind of go along with that that get developed. For example, if you live all alone in the woods, singing as loud as you want at 2 o'clock in the morning is not a problem. But if you live in an apartment, that's not going to be appreciated. In, the, in nature, in the wilderness, there's not stop signs and traffic lights that determine whether or not you can go. I've, I've had lots of opportunities when I've been sitting at a traffic light where there is no traffic at that time of the day. There's no cars. And I'm just waiting for a light to change. And, I'm, and I ask myself, why am I doing this? And it's because that's the rules when you live in a city. The, if, if the cities didn't have stop signs and traffic lights, the kind of destruction that would be unleashed would be unbelievable. So there's this interesting concept in Scripture, and we're a little bit surprised by it, and, and the author of Hebrews refers to it, and it's the idea of this. God is not taking us back to a few people in a garden. He's building a city. Scripture begins in a garden, but by the time we get to the end of Revelation, there's a new city. The goal of God is not less people. The goal of God is a holy city where people live in harmony and fulfill their potential. So the author of Hebrews begins to shed some light on something. There's a little bit of a tension that exists between the cities that we have and the city that God desires. And so the, this is the, in, uh, the tension we want to acknowledge today. There's a tension between the kind of city people built and the kind of city that God builds. And the reason there's a tension is that there are different values. There are different values. So let's use Jesus as our example. Jesus obviously lived with a strong set of values, and those values drove his behavior. So he brought hope to people who were absolutely desperate, and he brought light to people who lived in 
unbelievable darkness. And he brought healing to people who were, who were broken at all kinds of levels of their life. And he brought freedom to those who lived in incredible bondage. And he, brought, he spoke truth to those who were very, very powerful. And he made God seem very real and very near. near. And he made the kingdom of God seem very accessible, like anyone could access it. And you would think everyone would love Jesus for that, right? Not so much. The author of Hebrews tells us what happens. They took him outside of the city, and he suffered much. He was rejected. So who are the people responsible for this rejection and this crucifixion? Was it the religious culture? Was it the political culture? Was it the economic culture? Was it the sexualized culture? And the answer is yes. All of them. For example, the religious culture, they didn't like the way Jesus provided access to those who were deemed unworthy. The people who had been fractured by sin or trapped by its consequences. They didn't want anything to do with them. Religious people weren't very comfortable with that. And the political people, well, they didn't like the way Jesus wasn't afraid of them and wouldn't play their games. And you have to know, when you start living that way, People in power get anxious. And the economic culture, they didn't like Jesus either because he could impact their profit-making experience. For example, there's a story of a person who was just incredibly bound. The Bible describes that he had many demons in him. And I know it's a very, uh, 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 it's an odd concept in, in modern culture. But when Jesus cast these demons out, it went into some pigs and the pigs ran down a hill and into water and they all drowned. And that was a profit-making enterprise for lots of people in that community. And this is what they did. They came back to Jesus and they did not say, I'm so glad that that person found freedom. They said, you have to leave our region now. Because making money was more important to them. Or how about the sexualized culture? Jesus, People... People who live where they prioritize pleasure over commitment, they were frustrated by Jesus. So here's what you need to know. Everybody kicks Jesus out. Everybody kicks Jesus out. And the author of Hebrews tells us, if you are an actual follower of Jesus, there will be people who treat you as less too. You will have to go outside the city and you will have to bear the disgrace. There are people who will not invite you to certain things because you follow Jesus. There are people who will act awkward around you because you follow Jesus. There are people who will belittle your beliefs and they'll, they'll belittle your values because you follow Jesus. In fact, if you really fully follow Jesus, you are going to annoy the very religious, the very political, the people who are all about money and the people who are all about pleasure. That's what's true. And so the natural reaction when we experience this belittling and this, this, this uh, disengagement and, and the demeaning kind of experience that we can have, the natural reaction is to just avoid the people who are trying to avoid us. We want to create a place where they don't get in. We can keep them out. And we want to talk about the judgment that's going to come on them on those people for the way that they live. So we'll build our own little city. Might not actually be a city, but there's ways to build these little communities where we can be sure that the wrong people don't get in. And what I want you to know is that God has not called us to build a city. He's called us to serve our city. And there's a world of difference between those two things. It's really intriguing that as soon as he talks about, this author of Hebrews talks about us going outside of the city and bearing the disgrace, the very next thing he talks about is to offer a sacrifice of praise. He's not changing the topic. He's giving us a very important insight. First of all, what I want you to know is that God desires you to fully engage and have a conversation with him about all the nuanced emotions and complicated emotions that we have. You don't have to pretend anything with God ever. But we can develop a tendency to withhold praise because life is not what we hoped it would be. So scripture is calling us to this. It's saying rather than focusing on what is bad in our world, focus on what is good about God. A very different way to think, a very different way to talk. 
We live in an age of rage. Ranting has become the native language. If you speak gratitude and praise and thanksgiving, it's a foreign tongue now. Do not assume, here, please hear me, do not assume that God is as angry about something as you are. It is highly unlikely that you and God both get ticked off at the exact same things. <laughs> There's a great story about this in Scripture, actually. One of the most prominent people in the Old Testament, his name was Moses. He's the giver of the law, right? And uh, the, the nation of Israel is in this journey out of bondage and towards a promised land. They're in the wilderness. They've, they've, they're in a place now where there's no fresh water supply. And so God tells Moses, he said, I want you to go and stand in front of all the people and take your staff, and there's a big rock there, and I want you to strike the rock, and when you do that, water's going to flow out, and no one will perish. And so Moses takes his staff, and he goes over, and he strikes the rock, and just like God said, water comes out, and the entire nation survives being in the wilderness. Well, that wasn't the last time they were absent of fresh water supply. That happened again. Only this time God told Moses, I want you to go and I want you to speak to the rock. And when you call water out of the rock, the water will come forth. And so Moses started walking towards the rock and everybody's all gathered around the entire nation. Only this time, Moses is ticked off. And he just, he unloads on everybody. How long do we have to put up with all of you rebels? Why do I have to be the one to bring water for you? And he takes his staff in anger and he strikes the rock. And do you know what happened? Nothing. And do you know what angry people do when they do something and it doesn't work? They do it again. <laughs> and so he just strikes it all the harder. And this time water flows out because... God is not the kind of God that will let an entire generation perish just because one person is disobedient. But God had a private conversation with Moses afterwards. And he said, you will not be able to lead this people into the promised land because angry people can't lead people to their destiny or their potential. We, we just have to learn to focus on what's good about God instead of all the things that frustrate us. There's plenty of things that are frustrating. Learn to offer praise in the midst of hard times and hurtful circumstances, not because you're denying that they exist or pretending that they don't, but because it's not the only thing that's true right then. That God is still God, and God is still present, and God still has a plan, and it's a good thing to say it out loud. It really is. Then he says, don't forget to do good and share with others. Rather than focusing on what you don't have, learn to share what you do have. Rather than focusing on what you don't have, learn to share what you do have. That, that God seems to create these divine moments, these open doors, these miracle opportunities to share something that we have. Yesterday was a remarkable example of that. People shared their time. They, they walked and they ran in a race and they volunteered to set up and they volunteered to clean up and they, they kept track of people's times in the race and they handed out water and they took pictures and they had conversations. They shared what they had. And, and when they did that, it's what makes a real difference. When we praise and when we share, the author of Hebrews says, that's a sacrifice. Now just think about this. If we can only say something good about God when we're getting all of our way, and we can only share when we have too much, that's not really a sacrifice. And so it says, when we praise and when we share, it is a sacrifice that pleases God. So here's the challenge. We are we're kind of nomads. And eventually there'll be a city that's everything we want it to be. We're not there yet. So how are we to interact and respond to the cities we live in? And what you need to know is there's a great example of this from the Old Testament. There have been people who had been taken out of Jerusalem 
They were taken captive, and they were relocated. And this wasn't just a few. It was hundreds of people. And they were relocated hundreds of miles away to a place called Babylon, which was a very foreign culture to them. The language was different. All the style of clothing was different. The customs were different. The values were different. You, you couldn't find a more different place. And some of those people who were taken were religious leaders, and those religious leaders were very angry that they had been taken away from everything and everyone that they loved. And they just kept venting their anger and telling everyone, any minute now, God is going to come rescue us. God is going to come get us out of this. God is going to do a mighty work of deliverance. And Jeremiah, who was a prophet who still lived in Israel, he heard about these words that these prophets were giving and these religious leaders were saying. And so he sent everyone a letter. And the letter arrived in Babylon. And this is what it says. It is a stunning letter. And what Jeremiah tells them is, what you've been hearing is not correct. The religious leaders have been giving you bad information. Look at what he says, Jeremiah 29, verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to those I carried in exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. I'd like you to circle the word build. Build houses and settle down. I'd like you to circle the word plant in your notes. Plant gardens. Eat what they produce. I'd like you to circle the word marry. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Just circle the word pray. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Build where you are. Don't wait for a better place. Create a home where there can be peace and you pursue joy. Plant where you are. Focus on things that you can grow and will produce fruit over time. Love where you are. Marry. Have children. Produce and pursue intimacy and life. You will always have reasons to hide and protect your heart from intimacy. There's all kinds of things in culture that will drive that. God says, don't fall into that trap. And then he says, pray for the peace and the prosperity of the city where you are. Does that sound like religious language to you? Because there's so many commands and calls for God just to rain judgment on stuff that ticks us off. And the prophet Jeremiah says, there is a city that's coming that is more wonderful than you can possibly imagine. It is not here yet, so how should we live now? Pray for the peace and the prosperity of the place where you live, because when it does well, you will do well too. There is an enduring city that is coming. God will build his city in us before he builds his city for us. There's a way we learn to live, and we learn to live that way now. Let's bow our heads. I really believe that God is building a people who won't be defined by who rejected them, God is, is building a people who won't adopt the, the language of, of blame and shame and rage. God is building a people who care for the city they're in. They actually can praise God for the opportunities that they have. And they share what God has entrusted into their hands. And this is what God has called us to do. I know there's lots of things that break our hearts and frustrate us. But there's more happening than that in our world. Beneath the surface of all the pain that you see, a river of grace is flowing. A light is beginning to dawn. All of the worst things are starting to become untrue. the very ones who pushed him out of a city and crucified him in shame. 
is the one who's making all things right again. And he's starting with us. So Father, help us be a people who find praise on our lips and share what we have. Help us be a people who don't just speak the native tongue of frustration and fear, but learn to declare the good things about you and to see the opportunities you've created for us. Help us learn to be a people who pray for the prosperity of our cities. Because when they do well, we all do well. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.